Hey, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Holger Anne. I am from Munich, South Germany. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to speak within this audience. Is percutaneous needle fasciotomy a serious alternative to treat the Bidon's disease? Well, Felix Butter was the first to describe the disease pattern. He assumed that the pathology originates from the shrinked flexor tendons. The etiology is not really clear, but we all heard that the genetic factor is substantial. Ethnically, the North European people are more affected than the people of Africa. And in Germany, where I come from, we estimate that there are between 1.4 and 1.9 people are affected, which corresponds in incidence roughly to 2.4%. Commonly, we use the classification Monsieur Tubiana, first described 1961, stage 1, up to 45% total passive extension motion, uh, uh, extension deficit, stage 2, 45 to 90, stage 3, 90 to 135, and stage 4, more than 135 degree total passive extension deficit as a total amount of MCP, PRP, and the DOP joint. Well, this morning we heard a lot about the options concerning the surgical treatment. Basically, at least invasive is the needle fasciotomy, which was first described by Monsieur Lermusot in 1980. We can perform the mini open fasciotomy, that's the partial or selective fasciectomy and the complete fasciectomy, imaginary to reduce as much affected tissue as possible. More aggressive methods are the domedo fasciectomy and the total anterior tenoarthrolysis described by Monsieur Safar. Well, when I started to learn how to treat tubular disease, I learned to reduce the cords and fibers as complete as possible. It is agreed that the complete and partial fasciectomy is a time-consuming procedure regarding the operation as well as the period of recovery. Additionally, one has the risk of serious complications like infections, nerve lesions, diminished blood flow, intolerance for cold temperatures and not least reduced range of motion. Well, we all know those cases. Considering the, those pictures, could the percutaneous needle fasciotomy be an alternative treatment, whereas less invasive? For answering that question, we performed a retrospective study and examined patients we operated on between 2008 and 2009. The majority of the patients were categorized into Biana stage 1 and 2. The mean age was 59.7 years. We had 33 men and 14 women. We performed the needle fasciotomy at several levels and splinted the affected ray and his body for three months at night. Well, how does it work? <coughs> the affected finger was held in extended position in order, have, in order to have the cord prominent. Well, a 20 gauge needle placed on a syringe filled with local anesthesia was introduced. The first level was usually distal to the palmar grease, the second level proximal. The bevel was used to cut the cord from different angles. The most cases we've done needed only one or two levels in the palm to get the full extension back. Well, after having uh, the feeling the cord is cut or almost cut, we hyperextended the finger ray to crack the remained fibers. After finishing um, at one level, we injected little amount of local anesthesia and the cutting maneuver itself was done without anesthesia under the idea to prevent nerve damages. The patients were instructed to alert if there's any prick. After dressing was placed, um, we fitted a splint in fully extended position to wear for further three months at night during day. Unrestrictive hand and finger movement was recommended. Within the retrospective study, 43 patients with 58 rays were reviewed with a mean follow-up of 11.1 months. The patients were classified as follows, to be honest, stage 1, 34 patients, stage 2, 20, and stage 3, 4 patients. 52 rays were able to extend free. 
Six rays showed a recurrence from 5 to 15 degree. The recurrence rate was 10%. The mean improvement was 39.4 degree overall. We had no hematoma, no, no nerve or vessel lesion, but three minor skin lesions which result from the hyperextension maneuver and the cord is still adherent to the skin. Almost every patient would undergo the procedure again if necessary and inability to work lasts on average 11 days, which is remarkable. As we started to perform needle fasciotomy, concern number one was to produce nerve lesions with the blind technique. In 58 rays, even with different surgeons, we had no nerve nor artery lesion. Compared with other authors, Nerve, there are nerve lesions from 0 to 5%, whereas studies of the open technique have 0 to 20%. Concern number two was the rate of recurrence. We had a recurrence rate of 10% after 11 months. Other authors report recurrence rates between 24 and 65%, however, with a longer time of observation. The recurrence rate of different open technique report about 9 to 11 percent. Furthermore, it turned out that it is important to have a good, visible and definable cord without any arthrogenic contracture and although no, not statistically verifiable, stage 1 and 2 have better outcome than higher stages. Well, the advantages are obvious. The vast majority of patients are highly satisfied. We have a short operation time without the need of general anesthesia and a very short period of recovery. We have a low complication rate and we don't burn any bridges, which means that further operations are possible without trouble because of the marginally expected scar tissue. The disadvantages are the painful penetration of the skin, the remaining cord, and of course the higher recurrence rate well, with these facts in mind, I want to answer the initial question. Yes, of course, the percutaneous needle fasciotomy is a serious alternative with a good outcome and satisfied patients. We recommend the described technique for flexion contractures, stage 1 and 2, with a good definable cord and no arthrogenic contractures for patients with limited time who know very well about the increased uh, recurrence rates. Thank you very much. <laughs>